Mrs. Astra was known as the leader of the 400, but who ended up taking her place? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. In 1851, Stuyvesant Fish was born into an old money Manhattan family. His ancestors had been founding members of what we now know as New York, and included names such as the Livingstons and Stuyvesants. Mr. Fish inherited massive land holdings all around New York, but the great deal of real estate he owned in Manhattan ensured that his family wouldn't run out of money for generations. He took his role in high society very seriously. His wife Mammy, however, could not have been more opposite. She had also been born into high society, though she felt it was too formal and stuffy for her liking. From an early age, she chose not to continue her education and was said to be illiterate. Nonetheless, she became popular amongst the who's who's. Mimi was said to have a sharp and crude sense of humor, often making jokes at her own expense while flaunting the rules of social engagement. Her comedic nature often made her the center of attention, so it was no surprise when she asked her husband to build her a palatial mansion in Manhattan to fit in with the rest of high society. The couple had been living at their Gramercy Park residence, and, as refined and stately as their Second Empire-style home was, it was not large enough for the parties Mammy wished to host. They hired esteemed Gilded Age architect Stanford White to design for them a towering blonde brick and limestone mansion at 25 East 78th Street. From here, Mammy would be able to conquer high society and take Mrs. Astor's place, leading New York's elite in conjunction with Alva Belmont Vanderbilt and Tessie Ulrichs. The interior of the mansion was ready to host only the most outrageous social events from the 17th century dining room to the marble-clad stair hall. The second floor was strictly for dancing, where Mrs. Fish would jokingly welcome her dearest guest by saying things such as, Who invited you, and what are you doing here? The ballroom would usually fill up by midnight, with dances lasting until sunrise when all 1,000 guests were expected to leave. Just as the sun would rise, Mammy would make her way up to her gothic bedroom, though it was rumored that she never actually slept in the bed, but rather preferred to lounge in her dressing room. And as summer approached, she would dictate letters in her office, inviting all of high society to join her in Newport. Located high up on a hill off of Ocean Avenue, her colonial revival-style mansion overlooked rocky terrain. Finished by 1900, and with her husband's negotiation skills, the colossal cottage was completed for just $100,000, the modern equivalent of about $3.7 million. Opening the front doors of the mansion known as Crossways, we arrive in the entrance hall, which was designed to feel stately without being overly ostentatious. While Mammy entertained, Mr. Fish would usually sequester himself to the library, and if parties were to be too outrageous, he would vacation to Glencliff, a mansion in New York which he had inherited from his father. Back at Crossways, Mammy would have her staff stage the dining room with extra tables so that she could host up to 75 people for formal dinners. Due to the constraints on budget, however, her drawing room had to double as the ballroom. Her staff would clear the furniture out of the room to make plenty of space for dancing. After nearly a decade of cramming into the drawing room, Mr. Fish finally indulged Mammy by building her a new ballroom as an addition onto the house. She famously hosted an event in this room where she promised her guests would meet royalty, only to be introduced to a monkey dressed up in a costume. Some accounts even claim that by the end of the night, the monkey was throwing crystals and light bulbs at the guest as it swung from the crystal chandelier. This might just be folklore, but either way, it bolsters Mammy's reputation for hosting wild parties. Unfortunately, her time was cut short. In 1915, at the age of 61, she suffered a brain hemorrhage while walking around the gardens with her family at Glencliff. During her time leading high society, she sought to embrace shock and awe by never giving her guests what they expected, but always delivering a good time. She had her ups and downs over the years, with some people unable to accept her humor. She famously made fun of First Lady Mrs. Roosevelt's wardrobe, hosted a ball where all the guests were expected to arrive dirty and dressed as paupers, and made the wife of her husband's business partner cry after some heated and witty words were exchanged. But all that aside, people remembered her for her outlandish and outrageous parties. Mr. Fish continued living between each of their mansions until his own passing in 1923. While all four of their houses still stand, the original interiors have mostly been lost to renovations over the years. Which one was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.